Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In today's world of social media posts, comments, replies, shares, and likes, it has become an obsession for people to get noticed, sometimes doing extreme things to make it happen. Some take on dimwit internet challenges. Others perform dangerous stunts on film. Many hope to find fame by singing already popular songs. And then there are those on the darker side who want fame, killing simply to get their name in the paper and on television. And to the darker side of dark, there is Luke Magnata, who chose to seek fame in the most horrific of ways by becoming a murderer, on camera, and then becoming a cannibal while sending other body parts around the world, just for notoriety. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness… With Disney's live-action Aladdin came angry criticism regarding Will Smith and the role of the genie, both how he looked and how he acted. But the truth behind real genies is much more terrifying. An army wife and weirdo family member opens her heart and shares how horrible one of her homes felt, and the only relief she could find was moving out. For centuries, people in Britain have been reporting a large black beast terrorizing the countryside, killing the innocent, even now in the 21st century. Is the black shuck legend a ghost hound, a huge stray dog, or perhaps an escaped panther, maybe a werewolf? Or could it be a true-to-life hound from the fires of hell? The camping trip for young boys turns dark after a night of ghost stories that somehow come to life. A man goes hunting for hares in Australia and encounters a large hairy beast instead. A young boy lovingly takes care of his grandmother every day, and strange happenings in her house don't stop him. But first, Luca Magnata would do anything for fame, and he chose the darkest and most sadistic way to achieve it. We begin with that story. While you're listening, you might want to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com, you can find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, the Weird Darkness store, plus you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. When Lin Jun disappeared in 2012, his family and friends could never have imagined the horrors that lay in store. As the Luke Magnata case unfolded, police would find extreme narcissism, cannibalism, and degradation, the likes of which Canada had never seen before. In one of the most bizarre deaths of 2012, Magnata took Lin June's life on camera, posted it to the internet, gained a fan base, and even sent body parts around the world, just to cause a stir. The Luke Magnata crimes were grisly, and looking deeper into them is bound to make some people queasy. Before you listen on, be warned that this story is not for the faint of heart. Many descriptions here are pretty nauseating. You may be wondering what exactly did Luke Magnata do? Well, the better question may be, what didn't he do? His actions range from participating in maturely themed films 
to violating a human corpse. As stated earlier, not exactly something you want to hear before bed. That being said, the case of Magnata is one that is morbidly fascinating. Luke Magnata's biggest claim to horrifying fame came when he began dating Lin Jun. Jun hid his preference for men from many people and was an international Chinese student from Wuhan at Concordia University. He began seeing Magnata in 2012, and then one day, in May, he simply vanished. On May 25th, a video surfaced online called One Lunatic, One Ice Pick. In the video, Jun is seen tied to a bed frame while Magnata plunges into him over and over with an ice pick and a kitchen knife. Magnata then dismembers Jun and desecrates the lifeless body. There's even a dog brought in to chew on the body. It would take days for people to recognize that they were bearing witness to Lin Jun's actual demise. While the video still exists in some corners of the dark web, the description of its contents are graphic. Magnata used Jun's severed arm to fondle himself, forced his penis into the mouth of Jun's severed head, and further sodomized the corpse with a wine bottle. He also used a steak knife and a fork to cut away portions of Jun's flesh, as if he may eat them. While the video posted online does not show this happening, police later reveal that there is additional footage that was never shared on the internet. When they searched Magnata's apartment, they uncovered a longer version of the video and said that it looked like Magnata was eating Jun's flesh from his corpse. After he was caught, he was accused of cannibalism in court. As police searched his apartment, another horrifying development took place. Strange, smelly, and blood-stained packages began to show up at various political party offices and schools throughout Canada. A hand and a foot showed up in Ottawa political offices and were quickly linked to June. Falls Creek Elementary School in British Columbia received a body part package, as did St. George's School, a private school for boys, police realized they were still missing the head, the leg, and the other foot. While Jun's head was later discovered in a park, some of the body parts never did turn up. Magnata had a bit of history with the police before he even met Lin Jun. In 2010, he put up a video online called One Boy, Two Kittens, where he put two kittens in a vacuum bag, sucked out the air, and suffocated them. He was then seen rubbing the animal's lifeless bodies against his genitals. In another video, he drowned his pet cat, and in yet another, he fed a kitten to a very large snake. He did this while wearing a hood or a mask in order to hide his identity. However, he had posted with the cats before and several unique personal items in the videos could identify him. Still, this was not enough to get police heavily involved. Online activist groups were outraged as they tried to get police to take these actions seriously. Ominously enough, one member of an activist Facebook group posted, he might end up harming human beings one day, he might just not stop with animals. Prior to June's murder and the kitten videos, Magnata struggled to make ends meet. His modeling career and mediocre internet fame weren't bringing in enough cash for him, so Magnata ended up turning to more lurid means of getting income. After high school, he started doing pornography, particularly gay films. He also was rumored to have been a gay escort and was definitely a stripper at one point. These side jobs began in 2002 or 2003, with him first stripping at Remington's in Toronto and then moving on to recorded work where he played a straight man turned gay with regularity. He sometimes used the name Jimmy, which he kept when he became an escort sometime later. A few of the videos he did remain on various websites. Oddly enough, Luke Magnata was not always called 
Luke Magnata. Once upon a time, he was called Eric Clinton Kirk Newman, a considerably more ordinary name. Unfortunately, this name was the only part of his upbringing that could be considered normal. His mother and father were both teens when he was born, and he was homeschooled for much of his childhood with no contact with children his own age. His mother was a germaphobe, and it's rumored that even when he was six or seven, his mother forced him to keep wearing diapers. Magnata was verbally and physically abused, and it didn't help that his father's mental health was deteriorating. Money problems forced the Newmans out of their home, which actually proved beneficial for Magnata because he started going to an actual school. However, shortly afterwards, his parents decided to get a divorce when he was 12. From then on, Magnata lived with his mother and her new lover, who was also abusive. School wasn't going well. He was mercilessly teased, never graduated high school, and began showing signs of mental illness, just like his father. Given the nature of how much messed up stuff shows up on the internet, it makes sense that the public would be quick to call the video a fake. Magnata had posted a hint that he would put up the video days before it happened, and perhaps those who watched his violent videos expected another cat video. When it did show up, Mo didn't believe their eyes. The police were among this disbelieving group. On multiple occasions, Interpol, the FBI, and the Toronto police were informed of the video's existence. For days, they ignored the video, assuming it was a fake, even when a lawyer by the name of Roger Renville was the one trying to bring attention to the video. Members of the website eventually named Luke Magnata, and when Lynn's dismembered corpse was found in a suitcase outside a Montreal apartment building, police finally sprang into action. So, what was Magnata doing while police searched his apartment and tried to track down June's body parts? He was running away to Europe, not only to hide but to have a good time. Canada tried to let transportation services know that Magnata was wanted, but by the time they got wise, they were informed that he had already boarded a plane to Paris and police had reached his hotel room. He was gone, and all they found were pornographic magazines in his wake. From there, he stayed with random men, some of whom he slept with, though not all, and took videos of himself. He went to parties and lived as if he wasn't on the lam. Even while incarcerated, Magnata was obsessed with keeping up appearances, seeming to thrive on media attention. Because of this and the gruesome behavior, the judge decided that the media would not be allowed in the courtroom. The judge wanted to be certain that Magnata would not gain additional notoriety from his video or his actions. In addition, Magnata was kept in solitary confinement. Of course, Magnata still managed to attract attention. China responded to his anti-Asian sentiments, and his insanity defense was hotly debated. Keeping things quiet still didn't keep Magnata's name out of the papers. Magnata was not only obsessed with his physical appearance but also with his internet persona. He maintained a presence on Stormfront, a white supremacist site, and had at least 70 pages on Facebook. He also frequented snuff film and gore sites, particularly Best Gore. It was there that he posted the Lin Jun video, but not before posting a preview video, hyping up his watchers and promising a better video soon. After the attack, he posted about his actions, brazenly bragging and talking about his bloodlust. He made a video of himself smoking and enjoying life in Europe as he fled. He even told one reporter by email, once you hurt someone and taste blood, it's impossible to stop. Possibly the most terrifying thing left after Magnata's incarceration is that he still has people who greatly admire him. People send him love letters in prison, his dark videos still circulate online, and a few fans even try to emulate his look. There are fan pages for Magnata on Facebook and entire websites devoted to him. His cult following says they support him against persecution. 
one fan online stated, Maybe it's my mind's way of coping with the inexplicable dichotomy of beauty and the beast, the extreme beauty of the person versus the extreme ugliness of the alleged act. I don't know. All I do know is that I feel powerless to control these thoughts and there is an amazing, physical, warm sensation when I think of him. Something akin to love. Luckily for the rest of the populace, Magnata won't be getting out of prison to meet his fans anytime soon. Magnata was absolutely smitten with himself. In 2006, Magnata began dating a transgendered woman named Barbie. He shared about how deep his narcissism ran, as his apartment was like a shrine dedicated to himself and his favorite pastime was having his picture taken. In 2007, Magnata auditioned for a reality show called Cover Guy, during which he spoke at length about the work he had done, saying he was devastatingly good-looking. When he didn't get onto the show, he tried out for another reality show called Plastic Makes Perfect, where he told the judges, I've had my nose done, I've had two hair transplants, and I'm planning on having muscle implants in my pecs and my arms. For Magnata, appearance was everything. Magnata didn't stop with animal abuse. In 2004, Magnata began seeing a mentally handicapped woman. He took advantage of her and forced her to buy credit cards for him. Magnata then spent over $10,000 before he was caught and charged. During sentencing, Magnata was told he had a serious psychiatric issue and needs to take medication. His sentence was for 12 months probation. Police originally believed Magnata sexually assaulted the mentally handicapped woman and filmed it. However, the charges concerning that assault were dropped before the trial. Magnata loved spreading rumors about himself. While animal rights activists were hunting him down, Magnata would go on message boards and post pictures of himself as if saying, come and get me. There was even a time where he spread an internet rumor that he was dating Carla Homolka, who allegedly aided her husband, Paul Bernardo, in the assault and murder of at least three teenage girls. This was so well believed that he was interviewed about it by the Toronto Sun, where he coyly denied the very rumor he had started. If the mythological beings who appear in movies to grant people wishes were jinn rather than genies, the person who rubbed their lamp might wish they hadn't. Jinn are the supernatural creatures who inspired the modern-day genie. But unlike the magical characters of I Dream of Genie and Walt Disney's Aladdin, these beings aren't interested in helping people and making friends. Tales of jinn go back long before the advent of Islam, but their inclusion in the Quran gave them the notoriety that has allowed them to permeate our modern culture. In some parts of the world, flesh-eating malevolent jinn are lesser-known paranormal entities similar to lamp-dwelling genies. What is a jinn? There are different categories of jinn, and while not all are evil, the ones who are can be pretty scary. Some jinn, spelled J-I-N-N by the way, may be content with playing pranks, but others are said to possess people which can sometimes lead to exorcisms gone wrong. Since they live in a world parallel to humans, these beings can't be seen unless they reveal themselves. Like the creepy night hag, Jinn simultaneously exist in their world and ours, and they do whatever they please. Jinn are not inherently good or evil, although many choose to indulge in bad behavior. They have a reputation for being mischievous and are known to deceive and fool humans. In addition to pulling pranks, they may change shape, tell lies, or otherwise lead people astray and corrupt them. Some people also blame jinn for their health problems. In 2000, teachers at a school in Saudi Arabia blamed jinn for causing seizures in their students. Some even believe jinn can trick doctors into giving incorrect diagnoses and performing unnecessary surgeries. Islamic scholars refer to jinn as 
dual dimensional, meaning they have the ability to exist in both the human world and their own. Because of this, along with their ability to shapeshift, jinn are never seen by humans unless they choose to reveal themselves. In fact, jinn is translated as something concealed, invisible, or hidden. Some Islamic scholars believe humans will never even be able to understand jinn, aside from the few messengers and prophets who have been able to maintain contact. According to witnesses, jinn sometimes have hooves or hairy legs, can be male or female, and have the ability to fly. Some believe each person is assigned an individual jinn who watches over them and acts as a companion. The connection between jinn and human is sometimes so close that stories have emerged about humans and jinn falling in love. According to the Quran, Allah created angels the day before He created jinn, saying, Indeed, we created man from dried clay of black and smooth mud, and we created the jinn before that from the smokeless flame of fire. It's generally believed all angels are jinn, but not all jinn are angels. Unlike angels, which Allah created from light to follow His commandments, Allah gave jinn free will and magical powers, making them kind of like a group of super-powered humans. It was this free will that eventually led the jinn to grow prideful over thousands of years and believe themselves better than Allah. Angered by this, Allah sent the angels to fight them, offing most of the evil jinn in the process. Allah then created man from clay and ordered the angels and jinn to honor Adam, the first man. Jinn share many qualities with humans, the most important of which is free will. They choose what to do with their lives. They can get married, have children, drink, eat, find jobs, form communities, and decide whether or not to be Muslim. Like humans, jinn will supposedly be judged on the final day of reckoning. According to Islam, Allah assesses jinn just like humans and sends them to paradise or hell depending on how they lived. According to some Islamic researchers, jinn can possess people. In stories, people possessed by jinn often speak in tongues, have seizures, or become uncharacteristically aggressive. Luckily, believers say jinn can be exercised through ceremonies that include reading from the Quran or using incense, charms, animal teeth, or salt to drive the jinn away. In some cases, people have physically beaten possessed people to remove the jinn. In addition to people, jinn can also inhabit inanimate objects, including precious stones and gems. They may haunt houses or other buildings like schools, as well as sewers and drain pipes, and, apparently, bottles. While most people are unable to see jinn, poets and prophets share a special connection with them. Several Arabic poets throughout history claimed to have been inspired by their jinn, leading to the creation of the term sha'ir to explain this supernatural phenomenon. According to Islam, Allah sent the prophet Muhammad to share his word among the jinn, as well as humans. King Solomon of Israel could communicate with jinn. He used it to make them do what he wanted. Solomon reportedly forced rebellious jinn to help him cure sick people and persuade them to construct the first temple. While many jinn are content to either ignore or simply play pranks on humans, the category of jinn known as ghouls would rather eat them. As some of the most feared jinn, ghouls enjoy feasting on flesh and drinking blood. In ancient times, people told stories of ghouls who would walk through the desert to prey on travelers. The dangerous jinn would transform into beautiful women to attract their prey. Some legends claim men married ghouls without knowing their true form and became their next meal. It's believed ghouls spend most of their time in uninhabited or abandoned places, especially ruins and graveyards. Considered to be among the evilest of all jinn, Infrit 
built communities and established social hierarchies similar to those of humans. Ifrit usually marry and have children among members of their clan or tribes, but stories exist about their relations with humans. Some even marry humans and have children with them. Many people believe Ifrit hang out in ancient ruins to protect them. Legends claim these jinn will end the lives of trespassers that enter these areas without using the proper spells. Believers say people should avoid Ifrit whenever they can, as the spirits can be dangerous. The Romans adopted jinn into their culture as they expanded their empire into parts of modern Syria. Their version of jinn were benevolent guardians, though, and the Romans referred to these spirits in Latin as genii. Many years later, in 1704, Antoine Galland translated Arabian Nights, also known as 1001 Nights, for European readers for the first time. He produced the first translation in French and substituted the djinn of the story with the French word genie. As the story spread and people translated them into other languages, the word genie stuck, as did the idea of these spirits being all-powerful yet kind-hearted. A few stories in Arabian Nights, including Aladdin, didn't appear in the original and are believed to have been written by Galland himself. After inspecting Galland's diaries, scholars learned a man named Hannah Diab told Galland the additional stories, and Galland wrote them down. However they came to be, the tales in Arabian Nights molded our conception of genies into the beings seen in modern movies and television. Jinn known as Marid are what most people picture when they think of genies. Marid Jinn wield a lot of power and grow to a large size. Their name means giant in Arabic, and they have the ability to shapeshift. According to legend, Marid can grant wishes but require a lot of convincing to do so. It is said that flattery works to earn the favor of a Marid. If compliments don't do the trick, a summoner may need magic to imprison them. Although there is debate as to whether he was an angel or a jinn, one being named Iblis refused to obey Allah's words. When Allah created man and asked the angels and jinn to bow before Adam, Iblis thought himself superior to humans and refused. Allah then forced Iblis to leave paradise and live in hell. Iblis accepted this, but requested that he be allowed to remain in contact with humans so he could try to influence them towards evil. Some theologians compare Iblis to Satan, but point out Iblis has no power over humans. Any evil actions blamed on him are the fault of the sinners. Long before Muhammad began sharing the Quran, Many ethnic groups in the Middle East, including ancient Mesopotamians, Bedouins, and Arabs, believed in jinn. They worshipped them, connected the jinn to the natural world, and thought they held power over the fertility of the land. To the ancient Mesopotamians, these often shapeless demons were neither good nor bad, but could arrive via storms or strong winds to punish the wicked and cause disease. Although jinn are sometimes referred to as demons, the term is a translation of the Greek word daemon, meaning spirit, and didn't have implications of evil in the ancient world. Even frightening jinn like Pazuzu, featured in William Friedkin's 1973 film The Exorcist, were not all evil. The Mesopotamians sometimes called on Pazuzu to protect children and women. Keep listening. There's more weird darkness to come. Say ho, ho, ho! Hey, weirdos, our next Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, December 11th. Horror host Mistress Malicious is back, and she brings her entourage of miscreants from Mistress Peace Theater for an insanely fun Christmas episode. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians from 1964, starring Pia Zadora and Santa Claus. The Martians kidnap Santa Claus because there's nobody on Mars to give their children presents. Join us for this atrociously bad movie, jump into the chat with us to post 
poke fun at the acting, the sets, and to make jokes as we watch the film. And let's all celebrate Christmas with a really weird and wacky film hosted by a really weird and wacky woman. The Weirdo Watch Party is free, so grab your movie popcorn, candy, and soda and join us Saturday, December 11th. The film starts at 9 p.m. Central. That's 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film and also learn more about The Weirdo Watch Party on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. Hi, Darren. I'll start with saying that I'd like to remain anonymous about this, and you'll see why when you read on. I love your show and the way you handle the dark topics while also helping your listeners to keep a foot on safe ground. I've had a life of recurring creepiness and encounters and couldn't decide which topic to share with you until this morning. The universe forced me into a certain story that is not my own, well, partially. For years, I've lived on a military base. I got there with excitement and positivity, looking eagerly into the future with my new husband and new family. I was ecstatic at the possibilities. I believe that places have energy, as many of your past episodes may attest to as well. The place we lived in was dark and angry, sometimes painfully sad for no reason. I couldn't get myself to feel happy even though I had every reason to be happy. I've always been a happy person with the desire to push forward. Roadblocks were a thrilling challenge to me. Something about this place made me feel hopeless and miserable. I would have days where I literally would shake my head and think, wait, I'm not mad, or I don't feel this way right now, why am I feeling like this? The rest of the day, Sometimes for weeks I could keep this up. I'd remind myself that those weren't my feelings and I'd be so happy. Most of the time it was a major struggle. Mind you, I never felt this way before in my life. I would leave for weeks to visit friends, head out on the road for adventure. I'd immediately feel better, free, energetic, and amazing. It was always hard to go back home to that place. Well, I just moved, and I can't explain the feeling. Like I jumped off a cliff hoping for the best and landed gracefully on my feet, and the wind in my hair cleaned that place from me, and now I can live life the way I always have. I feel like myself again, and I'm so happy. I was just thinking to myself how I escaped that place and how glad that we made it out as a family. Well, Darren, this is where you and your show comes in. This morning, only days after moving, we heard news that there was a suicide on base. I don't know the airman, Ed would never say a name, but I needed to talk about it with someone. There have been more than five suicides this year already. I should clarify the way I felt so dark and trapped, so sad and lonely, and I'm not even the one serving our country. I'm just living there to be with my husband so I can't imagine feeling this way about where you live and having that added to the pressures of being active duty. I truly think the place has something hanging over it. I've never been so unhappy while having the perfect life. There were several scary events I could list for you. Ghost stories and creepy things happening constantly. Something mimicking our voices to each other in the house and much, much more, but this, Darren, this scares me to my bones. I was living someone else's emotions or being pulled down by the general energy of the place the whole time I had to be there. I can't explain it, but something is terribly wrong with that place. I wanted to message you because I know you'll pray and have a lot of people behind you sending good energy to this place. Perhaps everyone can take a moment to send good energy to the troops in general. No matter your opinion, these are young kids and they're out in very adult situations, alone. Every time I hear your intro, I think living in darkness isn't just depression. Sometimes it could be a lot more. Sometimes it can be your physical location. For me, this place was the darkness and now I'm free. 
Many young airmen and their spouses are there alone and with no one to keep in touch with to stay connected or to feel loved. I always feel like a strong powerhouse of a woman, and that place broke me down to bits. I'll have that place in my prayers every day of my life, but I never want to go back. You definitely don't need to read this on your show. I kind of just needed to vent a little, but if you do read it, I apologize for the vagueness. I know you already devote time to the topic. I truly feel there is more than depression going on here in this situation. It was so hard to live there. I'm blessed to have moved and feel so great right now. I feel a haze over the last few years of my life. I remember so many bad moments, but nothing in between. It's like I was just going through the motions of life, but not living. I feel like I woke up a few days ago from a three-year nightmare and it's the creepiest feeling. We moved and drove away knowing we don't have to go back only this past Tuesday. Well, I better stop rambling. Thank you for all you do. You're an inspiration and I love your work. I hope you know how much you're appreciated and admired by all us weirdos. Signed, Anonymous. A hound from hell has allegedly plagued the area of England known as the East Anglia for centuries. In 1577, reports of a large demonic dog that had killed multiple people struck fear into the deeply religious residents of the region. They described the dog as being seven feet tall, with glowing red eyes, and the ability to strike people lifeless in an instant, which it had reportedly done in two local churches. It was known as the Black Shuck. When it comes to the Black Shuck hellhound legend, verifiable facts are few and far between, but reported sightings and stories abound. Even today, hundreds of Brits every year claim to have seen the Black Shuck while walking through the fens and the foggy countryside. So what are they really seeing? Whatever it is, in their minds, they're witnessing an English legend from their childhoods come to life. The most famous sightings of the Black Shuck date back to the late 1500s, though some believe it appeared with a hunting party made up entirely of ghosts all the way back in 1127. In a pamphlet written in 1578, Abraham Fleming described the beast as a black dog or the devil in such a likeness. The pamphlet detailed events of the previous year when the Black Shuck reportedly attacked St. Mary's Church in Bungay. According to Fleming, the dog appeared to have wrung the necks of two people kneeling in prayer. On August 4, 1577, a ferocious thunderstorm struck the small Suffolk town of Bungay bringing the threat of strong winds and fire from lightning strikes. The citizens were terrified and gathered in St. Mary's Church to pray, but the church couldn't keep them safe. According to the legend, the church doors flew open and a giant black hellhound charged inside, slaying parishioners as it made its way down the aisle. An old verse goes, all down the church in midst of fire the hellish monster flew, and passing onward to the choir he many people slew. The demon dog then went on to Blytheburg Church, about 12 miles away, where it took the lives of even more people and caused further damage. Although no official records exist of the losses occurring that night, a church official did prepare a report that noted the passing of two men in the belfry of St. Mary's, and both churches did suffer significant damage. Today, the damage and mortality rates are attributed to the storm itself, but the superstition was part of life in those days. It's possible that the damage was real while the cause turned into a metaphoric moral warning. The Black Shuck has a mixed reputation. In the earlier days of the legend, the Shuck was known as a negative omen, in its first encounters. It was even said to have eliminated people directly. Today, the Shuck's reputation has received an unlikely makeover. 
Some modern witnesses, particularly women, have reported that the shuck acted as a protector and guided them home when they were lost at night. Numerous witnesses have described the black shuck over the years. Most of the descriptions are consistent, except for the shuck's eyes. While most agree that they glow bright red, some say the shuck has only one giant eye in the middle of its head. The rest of the general description includes a roughly seven-foot-tall body, shaggy black fur, and a snarling mouth filled with sharp teeth. Perhaps the most chilling part concerns the sounds the shuck makes or doesn't make. Although his howling makes the hearer's blood run cold, his footfalls make no sound, according to a 1901 account. In 2014, archaeologists discovered a skeleton in a shallow grave on the grounds of the Crumbian Lyston Abbey in Suffolk. They determined the bones belonged to an enormous male dog around seven feet tall. It was buried 20 inches underground alongside pottery shards that dated back to the late 1500s. Some chose to believe the bones proved the shuck's existence, while others were quick to say it was all a hoax. While it would be exciting to find the skeleton of the animal that terrorized East Anglia 500 years ago, the more likely explanation is that it was a large pet dog that belonged to a member of the church. They look like scorch marks from a candle, but according to many East Anglians, the burn marks still visible on a door in the Blytheburg church were left by the black shuck itself. In other versions of the story, the marks were left not by the demon dog, but by the devil himself as he entered or left the church. Those who believe and appreciate the story of the black shuck treasure the door today. Along with the canine skeleton found in another nearby abbey, the door marks are the best available physical proof of the black shuck, even if they are inconclusive. The black shuck's legend has penetrated far beyond its home in East Anglia. Today, many black dog inns and pubs exist throughout England. The shuck has gone from terrifying legend to cultural icon, at least in the daytime. The town of Bungay, home to one of the churches the Black Shuck was said to have attacked in 1577, embraces its Shuck connection. The town's crest incorporates a black dog running on a lightning bolt, and Bungay's community football club is called the Black Dogs. While the Black Dog of East Anglia is mainly known as the Black Shuck, ghostly black dogs go by many names in England and around the world including the Girt Dog, Padfoot, Bargast, the Hairy Hound, the Yeth Hound, the Grim, and Kusith. The name Shuck has two potential origins. The Old English Skucka, which means devil, demon, or goblin, and Shucky in the local dialect, which means shaggy, possibly referencing the dog's black coat. Although the legend of the Black Shuck sounds like a story purely from the past, people still report plenty of sightings of the giant ghostly hound even today. A website called Shuckland is dedicated to sightings of the dog. A Reddit user recalled a Black Shuck encounter that took place in a foggy area near a meadow in Cambridge. I suddenly saw something sprint through the fog in front of me. I thought I was hallucinating as I was sleep-deprived, so I called out, Oi! If that's someone messing around trying to be funny, it's not working! Getting more and more unnerved by the second, I suddenly saw the black streak run around me again. As I tried to get my bearings, I heard a heart-stopping growl. Like a Rottweiler was ready to attack, that guttural, snarling growl they make when they really want to hurt you. No way was it a deer, a fox, or a person. It was either a fuming dog or something else. Not being able to see where I was going, I slipped, rolling down a riverbank. I saw this huge black, shaggy-coated dog almost like a huge mix of an Irish wolfhound and a Newfoundland. Five feet tall, just sitting down on the opposite bank, its piercing red eyes staring at me. They bore into my soul, almost letting me know that morning I was very lucky 
to be on the opposite side of the bank. Tales of the Black Shuck date back about 500 years when native wolves still roamed the British forests and fields. As some wolves are black, it's possible that large wolves were responsible for some of the alleged black shuck sightings. Wolves were hunted to extinction in the UK around 300 years ago because they attacked herds of sheep when the country was in the midst of a wool production boom. Although the black shuck has always been described as a canine, one modern theory to explain shuck sightings suggests it might be a big cat. Not a large house cat, but a jaguar or panther, which can be completely black. As unlikely as it may seem in rural England, people have reported hundreds of big cat sightings there, from lions to leopards. Because the animals are not native to the UK, local officials look into places the cats could have escaped or been illegally released from, such as zoos or private collections. Some East Anglians believe the black shuck is simply an old legend, used to scare children and make them behave. That may be true, but plenty of frightened adults still report seeing the black shuck today. So what should you do if you encounter the shuck while wandering the English countryside? If you face a large, living, angry dog, the smartest move is to stay calm and not make eye contact. If the dog tries to attack you, try to give it something to bite other than you, such as a jacket, sweatshirt, stick, or shoe. Safeguard the most vulnerable areas of your body – fingers, face, thighs, chest, and throat. Many animal shelters face an issue called black dog syndrome. Black dogs, especially large ones, have a much harder time getting adopted than lighter colored dogs. A possible cause might be negative associations attributed to black animals. Black cats are associated with witches and bad luck, for example, and they too have a hard time being adopted. The centuries-old connection between black dogs and the devil has been reinforced over generations, with children growing up hearing the tale of the black shuck. And not just in England. Worldwide, stories of black devil dogs have made black dog syndrome a global problem. Organizations have formed to help black dogs in shelters and to educate the public to remove layers of unwarranted fear. Stories of strange animals are well entrenched in Australian folklore as well. Reports of tigers, panthers, and pumas are common throughout the south coast of New South Wales, but perhaps the strangest of all these tales are reports of hair-covered, man-like monsters. One south coast location with a long history of these stories is the coastal town of Eden. Surrounded by beautiful national parks and dense bushland, the town is situated on historic Twofold Bay. Eden is a popular holiday destination. During the 1970s, Koss Gynes of Frankston, Victoria and his family spent several Christmas holidays in the area. One sunny afternoon in December 1977, Mr. Gynes took his sons to Monk Farm, a long-abandoned overgrown property 16 kilometers inland from Pambula. The plan was to do a little rabbit shooting. Not everything, however, went quite according to plan. Just after sunset, with plenty of light remaining, Mr. Gines was walking very quietly down a gully when he was startled by a sudden crash in the bracken. I swung around, he said, startled, anticipating perhaps a kangaroo, and saw the back of a huge black creature like a gorilla making off from only 10 meters. I brought up my shotgun and had a shot at it. No way I'd miss from that range but it made no noise, just loped off into a cavity in the scrub. Although upright, the creature wasn't particularly tall, only about the height of a small man, but much, much broader. The detail that stayed most vividly in Mr. Gine's mind was the way its dome-shaped head seemed to sit directly on its shoulders, as if it had no neck at all. After 20 years in Australia, 
Mr. Gines, originally from Greece, was familiar with all of the larger native animals, so he assumed the creature was an escaped gorilla. Although it seemed to have departed, he hurried to stand guard over his sons as they cleaned rabbits in a nearby creek. He thought later the creature might have blundered into him while seeking to avoid the boys. One interesting aspect of Mr. Gines' experience is that just six kilometers south of where he shot the gorilla, a steep, stark, rather eerie-looking mountain called Egan Peaks, or the Jingera, looms high above the surrounding bush. Colonial-era Aborigines believed the Jingera to be an abode of the Yahoo, a strange, hair-covered, man-like creature. Mr. Gines wasn't the first person in the Eden area to claim to have encountered a gorilla. The Sydney Catholic Press carried the following report from Candelo in early August 1903. A great sensation was caused here last Thursday when a gentleman came into the township and stated that he was startled by seeing what he termed a gorilla between Candelo and here. He says it was fully the size of a full-grown man with abnormally long arms and large head. It bounded right onto the cutting, gazed at him in a weird sort of way, and made a most unearthly noise. It then leaped right over a fence and made for the ranges with the speed of an antelope. The early 1900s saw many sightings. In August 1906, the Bega Budget carried the following report from Eden. Mr. Al Smith of the Lakes, Eden District, distinctly saw a hairy man a short distance from him a few days ago and had a shot at it with a shotgun without effect. He says it strongly resembles a gorilla, is between five and six feet high, has long hair over the main body and short arms. Seven years later, in 1913, the Lismore Northern Star described a similar experience near Mountaintop. Fred Alcock had an encounter with what he terms a hairy man at Mountaintop Eden one night lately. He was riding along when he noticed something coming towards him on all fours. On getting close to him, it straightened up to its full height, and Fred's horse, aided by its rider, not choosing to wait, made a record trip to Greenland. A Delegate Argus item from June 1930 also tells of a strange animal seen near Nulika. Children of the Nulika River settlement have been scared and excited by the appearance in proximity to their homes of a strange animal, brown in color, much larger than the average cattle dog and resembling a monkey in shape. That, at least, is the description given of it by Tommy Bobbin, the biggest of the two boys who have seen it. He has seen it on several occasions, once at a distance of only a few feet. The first time he saw it, the animal was sitting up in a gorilla-like attitude, with what appeared to be a stick in one of its hands. Terrified but brave, Tommy threw at it a cob of corn which he was eating and thereupon the horrible-looking creature disappeared into the scrub. Subsequently, it was seen by other children, and they ran homeward, screaming hysterically. All attempts to convince the children that the animal may have been a strange dog are scouted by the children, some of whom at least are old enough to know the difference between a monkey and a dog. The parents have so far not sighted the animal, the identity of which is so far a complete mystery. Many local residents still claim something strange lurks in the Eden bush. In the mid-1980s, when George Fairweather was 16 or 17 years old, he, Michael Eines, and Andrew Petrie had a frightening encounter on the southern outskirts of Eden. As they were walking along a narrow track accompanied by Michael's large, rather savage bull terrier, they all suddenly seemed to sense something was amiss. It was almost like a bit of psychic experience, said George, because we all seemed to stop together, including the dog. Everybody knew something was not right. We stopped dead and then saw the thing. The thing was a seven or eight foot tall loping animal, and it crossed the path only 10 or 15 feet ahead. Even 13 years later, just thinking about it gave George a funny, wobbly feeling in the legs. It took two or three good steps across the track, towards a gully, and it was gone. It was just a silhouette, really. It was a full moon and a bit overcast. We couldn't see any hair or detail, but it was much taller than any man, even while stooped. It seemed bent at the knees and had a peculiar, non-human gait difficult to describe. 
there was no vocalization or even the sound of footfalls. No unusual odor was apparent. They froze for a good couple of seconds, then turned and walked away about 20 meters, walking as if over broken glass, and then ran. In the mid-1990s, while fossicking in a quarry six kilometers south of Eden, local resident Maria Spear noticed a more than two-meter-tall creature watching her from a nearby bush. It was brown, thick-set, and short-necked with powerful, solid shoulders, she said. It was standing upright on two legs, and when it saw me, it crashed off into the bush. My impression was that I had seen a powerful, man-like creature. America's Bigfoot would be an identical type. So exactly what is haunting the dark woods that surround this beautiful, remote holiday destination? Up next, a camping trip for young boys turns dark after a night of ghost stories that somehow comes to life. And a young boy lovingly takes care of his grandmother every day. And strange happenings in her house don't stop him. These stories are coming up on Weird Darkness. Coffee. It's a necessity. Most of us can't be bothered to even be civil to our families until we've had our first cup of joe. I can drink coffee all day, and often do, and now I've chosen an exclusive coffee just for the task. Weird Dark Roast Coffee. I love chocolate, I mean, who doesn't? So I specifically asked for a blend with at least a hint of cocoa, and Evansville Coffee, who roasts each bag to order, knocked it out of the park when they sent me a bag to taste test for approval. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that makes it great hot or cold. Personally, I like to put a little milk in it when I'm drinking it hot, but it is amazing black and poured over ice. Well, now you can drink it too. And the only place you can find Weird Dark Roast Coffee is at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm so sure you'll love it that we've even set it up for you to get free delivery on your first order if you use the promo code WEIRD. Hi. I'm not really sure if this story is a ghost story in the true sense of the word, but it's definitely weird and does involve darkness, so it might be what you're looking for. I was about eight or nine years old when I had the chance to attend a summer cubs camp in England. For those who don't know, cubs is like scouts, but for younger children. Anyway, at the camp we did the usual things like building campfires, hiking, and generally behaving like hyperactive children do. There was about ten of us in the troop and we shared a couple of tents between us. We were confined to these tents from about 9 p.m., and as the leaders were still up until much later, there was no real chance to sneak out in other tents or go exploring at night. This was probably why we ended up telling ghost stories in the tent. From what I remember, most of the ghost stories were just reworkings of Ghostbuster cartoons, but there was one kid who I'll call Richard who said that when his brother had been to the camp a few years before, he had seen a strange human-shaped shadow by the side of the lake. For some reason, this story seemed a bit more believable than the others, but it didn't stop me from getting a good night's sleep. A couple days later, the leaders surprised us with a late-night expedition which, after a walk of a couple of miles, led us to a campfire next to a lake. We had a great time eating hot dogs and drinking pop before sitting down around the campfire while packing our bags in preparation for the walk back to the camp. A couple of the kids and one of the leaders had walked off to the edge of the lake as it was clear night to enjoy the view. I was asked to go and tell them that it was time for us to leave. I walked to them, and as it was a clear night with a full moon, it was easy to see them. I walked towards them, but they didn't hear me, so I walked closer. They were standing on the edge of a small cliff, and I was walking through a small group of trees. As I got closer, I stopped, as I could see a mist or shadow near them. This seemed a bit strange, as it was a clear, dry night and I don't remember there being much wind. This mist shadow seemed really weird, as it kind of had an indistinct form and almost seemed to be glittering. I was so engrossed with it that at first I didn't notice another shadow closer to Richard. 
It's hard to describe, but it scared me to the point that all I could see was the cliff, Richard, and the shadows. But as soon as I saw the second shadow, they both seemed to collapse upon themselves. At this point, the group turned around and spotted me. I was going to tell them what I saw, but it didn't exactly sound believable, as I barely believed it myself. I did not sleep very well that night. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now and really enjoy it, and even though you have lots of listeners sending in similar stories, I thought that I'd tell you about it, as I know what I saw that night, even if no one else did. During my early teenage years, my parents told me to look out for my grandmother since her helper got injured when she accidentally slipped going down a ramp. Since it was my grandmother personally who asked my parents for me to look out for her at their house, I gladly agreed. As I remember, my grandmother was on her 90th year by that time. It was okay for me since our house is just next door. Before going to school in the morning, I would prepare her breakfast. Right after going to school, I would go directly to my grandma's house and assist her with what she needed, make her a cup of coffee, fetch her slippers, guide her to going to the bathroom, even watch TV with her for a while. Every night, I would tuck her in bed. I sleep every night inside her room, just by the sofa near her bed. There's a half wall separating us. It remained barely covered for me to still see her if she's doing okay. We share one electric fan that turns simultaneously to the both of us. Though there is an air conditioner unit on her room, we only use it if it's burning hot inside the room. All was going well. We enjoyed accompanying each other for the past few months. Well, that was until strange things started to happen. One night, while lying by the couch inside my grandma's room, I heard the door creak. I can see clearly from where I was lying the door had opened. I thought that maybe it was just not closed tight and the wind blew it, which seldomly happens. I decided to stand up to close the door. I looked outside first to see if someone might have pushed the door open, but no one was there. I closed the door and went back to bed. After a few minutes, it opened again. I got up quickly thinking I might have just not closed it tight or someone's still awake and playing a prank on me. I immediately looked outside and saw someone running up the next floor, giggling. I quickly thought that it was my cousin because his room was upstairs and we mostly do pranks to each other. With a bit of frustration, I shouted to him, "'Dang it, Mel! Stop playing around! You might wake up Lola!' Well, After that, I closed and locked both locks of the door so that he would not be able to do it again. I was irritated by that and decided to lie down and pick up my phone. I messaged my aunt to tell my cousin not to do that during this time of night for Grandma might wake up. I decided to play games on my phone to feel sleepy. After a few minutes later, my eyes were ready to rest when suddenly my phone beeped. It was a message from my aunt replying to me. I opened the message and it read, Hi, Mac. Mel's not home yet from school. They're finishing up dance practice. Maybe it was Mike whom you saw. I had goosebumps raising all over me. That couldn't have been Mike. I know that Mike isn't home yet, for he told me early that morning that he'd be staying at a friend's house. Just after realizing that, I heard something. It was rattling sounds that came from the door, as if someone was trying to open it. Click. I heard a sound, and sure, that was the sound of the first door handle being unlocked. Click. Another click, and I was very sure that was the second door lock. Creak. The door slowly opened. From where I was lying, I could see clearly the door slowly open as the door was now fully open. I heard a giggling sound and saw a shadow cast from the light outside. It was a figure of a little kid standing just by the door. Just by then, I saw it moved like it was slowly walking inside the room. I was now freaking out and started to panic. Not knowing what to do, I just quickly covered my face with the blanket. Now I can hear the giggling sound getting louder and louder and felt like it was getting closer and closer to me. 
Next thing I knew, I woke up at our house with a high fever and couldn't speak. When I got better, my mom told me that my cousin was knocking by the door that morning, but I wasn't answering. My grandma was the one who had hurriedly opened the door and told my cousin that I was shaking and had a high fever. They tried to talk to me, but I wasn't speaking, so my cousin decided to lift and carry me back to our house to get treated. I don't recall any of that happening. I didn't tell anyone yet what I saw that night, for they might think that it was just a bad nightmare that I'd had, but for me, it was very much real. Two days later, after feeling better, I returned back to my grandmother's house after school. She asked me to prepare a meal for her and a hot cocoa because she was feeling hungry. I went to the kitchen and prepared it. She asked me if I could bring it inside her room instead because her knees were aching and it's difficult for her to walk to the kitchen. I agreed and went back to the kitchen to bring the meal to her. As I gave her the hot chocolate, she said to me, Mac, can you also give that little kid some hot cocoa? She's been standing there all day now. I felt a chill all over my body as she pointed by the door where she claims to see the little kid. I turned around but saw no one there. I told her that nobody's there, but she kept on insisting and pointing that there's a little kid standing by the door. After that, I decided to tell my parents what happened on the night I had a high fever. They weren't all that surprised because of what they already knew. They told me that sometimes at night they see by the kitchen window a little kid running around as if playing. Sometimes they could even hear the giggle of a little kid. They never told me this until that moment, afraid I might not want to accompany my grandma. Right after that, they asked for the house to get blessed, but at that point, I no longer always stayed at my grandma's house. Me and my brother alternately went there to accompany her. If you made it this far, welcome to the Weirdo Family. If you like the podcast, please tell your friends and family about it however you can and get them to become weirdos too. And I'd greatly appreciate you leaving a review in the podcast app you listen from. That helps the podcast get noticed. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Model, Actor, Cannibal is by Laura Allen for Ranker. The Horror Behind Real Genies is by Aaron McCann for Graveyard Shift. There's No Place Like Any Place Other Than Home was submitted anonymously to WeirdDarkness.com. The Hellhound of England is by Rachel Sowerby. Shadows on the Cliff is by Weirdo Family member Mark Whiteman, submitted directly to WeirdDarkness.com. The Gorillas of Eden is by Cropster for The Fortian. And The Other Company is by Mark Uloboni for The Ghost Attic. Weird Darkness theme by Alibi Music. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. And a final thought. Life is short. Don't take one day for granted. Everything can change in a moment. Be grateful for all you have and all that you are. Remember who's most important to you and always cherish them. Life is a gift and we are blessed. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Want to receive the commercial-free version of Weird Darkness every day? For just $5 per month, you can become a patron at WeirdDarkness.com. As a patron, you get commercial-free episodes of Weird Darkness every day, bonus audio, and you also receive chapters of audiobooks as I narrate them, even before the authors and publishers hear them. But more than that, as a patron, you're also helping to reach people who are desperately hurting with depression and anxiety. You get the benefits of being a patron, and you also benefit others who are hurting at the same time. Become a patron at WeirdDarkness.com.